I'm on sick leave from work at the moment, and my therapist has advised me to partake in what's called cognitive behavioral therapy. According to our National Health Services website, cognitive behavioral therapy is a talking or writing therapy that can help a person manage their problems by changing the way they think and behave. The website says it's most commonly used to treat anxiety and depression, but also can be useful for other mental and physical health problems. And right now, I'm dealing with some serious mental problems. It all started back in the summer of 2021. You see, I have a degree in sports science and physiotherapy from John Moores University in Liverpool. And as some of you will know all too well, one of the biggest industries to be hit in the past couple of years are gyms and other sports venues. It's not so bad anymore. And I was actually in the process of reapplying to a number of different venues at the end of last year. But the ongoing problems I've been experiencing have put a sharp dent into my ability to properly maintain my professionalism. And so, here I am, on sick leave from a night porter's job at a budget hotel. Nothing against anyone who works night shifts, works as a porter, or even an overnight security guard. Work is work. And anyone who gives up their time to support themselves, or especially a family, is to be respected. But for me, being forced to give up my dream career to be all alone in an old Georgian townhouse was demoralizing to say the least. I've always been something of a gregarious type. Always playing sports, watching sports, talking sports in bars with friends or complete strangers. So going from a hyper-social environment to an extremely anti-social one was extremely debilitating. And I think this has been the number one factor in the decline of my mental health. But that's not why I'm writing to you. After all, you're in the business of scary stories and what happened, well, what's still happening to me to some extent, has been one of the most terrifying and horrific experiences of my life. So, it was the summer when I was forced out of my job and had to look for another one. But I found that despite some industries being closed off completely, some were severely in need of additional employees thanks to sickness, self-isolation, or simply stress. And one of the long-term positions I applied for was that of a night porter at an old hotel. I say old, it was built at around 1820, but it's received several renovations since then. So despite a rather elegant facade, it's decidedly modern on the inside. We're talking key card locks, a very swanky, polished steel lift, and most importantly to my hours of solitude, super fast Wi-Fi. I had access to some gourmet coffee making facilities. I was allowed to use the hotel's kitchen to make myself my shift meal. And due to people's reluctance to travel, the hotel remained completely empty for the vast majority of the time that I was there. And business only picked up again about the time I started experiencing mental health problems. It was a very, very lonely existence. And despite the 100 megabyte a second broadband the hotel had, my employer's demands were such that I didn't really have much time for mindless surfing. Yet, even when I have a few moments to myself, there's only so much of YouTube I can stomach in one sitting before you start to get very, very bored indeed. And I knew the boredom and relative inactivity were becoming an issue one night when I had my very first visual hallucination. You know in cartoons when a character sees something that he or she doesn't believe is real? and they rub their eyes comically before opening them again. That's a very real and common reaction to visual hallucinations, and it was quite surreal that it was my first reaction to seeing what I saw. The first thought that comes into your head once you realize what you're seeing is a physical impossibility, is that there's either something wrong with your eyes or something in them. So, as one football-sized spot on the wall began to almost bubble and froth before my eyes, that's exactly what I did. Only when I'd finished rubbing them, the spot on the wall kept frothing for a second before finally subsiding. I spent the next half an hour or so neglecting my patrol duties and googling visual hallucinations. What followed was a veritable rabbit hole of mental health conditions such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, and other much more devastating illnesses like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. Since I didn't have a drinking problem and wasn't in the habit of taking hallucinogenic drugs, 
Those first four conditions honestly scared the life out of me. I wasn't on any meds. I hadn't had surgery. I didn't think I was depressed or bereaved, although I found myself morbidly hoping that I was severely depressed as that'd at least be better than having my brain rot away before my 30th birthday. So what in God's name could have caused such a thing? Given how anxious I was, I decided to book a doctor's appointment as soon as I was able. But to my dismay, the policy of my local GP was not to receive any in-person visits. Because of the current situation, everything had to be done over the phone. Because of the huge demand for telephone appointments, it was around 48 hours before I could actually secure one. I can't even find the words to describe how desperate I was, and since the nurse didn't see my condition to be life-threatening, she asked if I'd considered taking my life. Of course, I said no. I was basically bumped down the waiting list and told I might have to wait two whole days for a callback. I was so scared I'd experienced another hallucination that time, but despite me hoping and sometimes even praying for them not to return, they did. And this time, it was even worse. There's this old painting in one of the hallways of the hotel, and all it depicts is two people walking through some park in Paris with the Eiffel Tower in the background. It's not remotely creepy, has this rather generic, almost boring feel to it. And I don't think I'd look at it properly more than two or three times during the whole time I'd work there. But you know how when you're at a certain level of familiarity with your environment that a slight change seems to just jump out at you? Well, when I was still waiting for the callback from my GP, I walked past the painting one night and stopped dead in my tracks. The few strokes of paint that made up the two people was shimmering slightly in the exact same way the wall had when I suffered my first hallucination. Then, I know this sounds completely insane, but the two people turned their heads to look at me. Okay, so they didn't actually turn their heads. It's a painting, and paintings don't move, do they? But you know in a dream when you just know someone is there, even though you can't see them? That's the closest thing I can describe to what I felt that night. I couldn't see the two figures looking at me, I just felt it in my bones. I suppose that gives away just how far gone I am. That I could even write something like that to you and feel like it makes even a shred of sense. But please try to understand me when I say that it was one of the most disturbing, frightening, and harrowing experiences in my life. To feel like you're losing complete control over your mind and your environment. Sometimes I feel like that's a fate worse than death. I was just frozen for a few moments watching as the two figures began to dissolve into a mess of limbs and facial features, surging and bubbling up until they were indistinguishable from one another, like a multi-limbed, two-faced abomination made up of arms and eyes and teeth and fingers. I remember just running back to the porter's office and shutting myself inside, all in the grip of the first real panic attack I've ever had in my life. I sat down in the corner of the room, facing the wall with my eyes clamped shut, just praying for the whole horrible ordeal to just end. I'm not even ashamed to say that when I finally seemed to gain a bit of sense, I had this quiet little cry in the office. I never thought mental health issues would ever affect me, not in a million years. I've always been a pretty chill, very normal kind of person. You could even accuse me of being flat out boring and I don't think I'd have taken too much offense. But oh. How wrong I was. And part of the reason I'm writing this is so that you, and your viewers should you choose to read this, are aware that these things can happen to anyone. Absolutely anyone. But you shouldn't be afraid and you shouldn't ever think that it's the end of the world. The human brain is like any complex machine. Sometimes it breaks down and needs a little servicing to get it running again. And that's how the doctor explained it to me and it made total sense. And not only that, but... When they told me something along the lines of, you're having a normal reaction to a very abnormal situation, I felt like I wasn't so alone anymore. I suppose that gives away the rather anticlimactic ending to my story. I got my call back, almost exactly 48 hours from when I made the first call, and honestly, it couldn't have come at a moment too soon. I felt jittery with relief when I finally heard the words, I'm Dr. So-and-so from the Elms Medical Center. 
and I was soon in possession of an electronic prescription which allowed me to purchase a drug called trifluoperazine. And let me tell you, they've really helped, but as a precaution, I've been on sick leave for the past two months or so while my condition is being monitored remotely. All in all, it looks like I'm on track to a full recovery, but just how long that'll take is something my doctors just aren't sure of. But I can assure you, I've been treating this whole thing the same way I treat my fitness training. When it gets hard, when I feel like I can't continue, I just remind myself that I'm much, much stronger than I think I am, and that it's always darkest before the dawn. I also feel that I should add that your channel and your lovely community of listeners, or viewers, whatever format they prefer, have been such a great help to me over the last 18 months, and but I honestly don't think I have fared nearly as well without your calming, interesting videos, which really help me keep my mind off of things. So thank you. Keep up the great work, and hopefully I'll be able to send another email in the future saying how I've made a full and complete recovery. So this isn't strictly my night shift story but it involves interactions with a guy who worked for a company that monitored the nighttime security systems of the institution that used to employ me. You see, I used to hold a position of executive director of quite a large science museum on the eastern seaboard and, at one time, we hosted a human cadaver exhibit, very similar to body works over in Houston, Texas. For those that are unfamiliar with such exhibits, Giving your body away to medical science upon your death isn't the only way to recycle your corpse. You can actually volunteer to be given to a museum or some other such institution to be displayed to the general public. The skeletons you see at the front of biology classes tend not to be real anymore, as cheaper plastic options tend to be available. But some of them are real, and it's due to selfless individuals who allow others to learn from what they're not using anymore. Yes, I know it's very morbid, but it's also incredibly fascinating, and you'd be shocked at how many people are attracted to such displays. So, with that in mind, we hosted our own, and the run generated a ton of money for the museum. And that wasn't the only reason the exhibit was memorable. In fact, it sticks out in my mind for entirely different reasons, and let me tell you why. One night, right in the middle of the exhibition's run, I received a call from the security company that monitored the museum out of hours. It was the middle of the night, just after 1.30 a.m., and since part of my job was to oversee the museum's overall security, it was me that had to take the call. I remember rolling over half asleep before seeing the company's name flashing up on my phone screen. A lot of the time it was just a false alarm, and after reviewing security camera footage from my laptop, in conjunction with one of their staff members, I could give the all clear and head back to sleep. Hardly the most efficient way of doing things, and trust me, I let our board of directors know this on multiple occasions, but the museum took its security very, very seriously. So unfortunately, it was something of a necessary evil to justify my inflated salary. So, as I said, I see the name of the company, so I roll out of bed while answering the phone stumbling over towards my laptop to bring up the remote CCTV program. We didn't just have security cameras either. Due to the immense value of some of the equipment present in the museum, we had a series of motion detectors too. If someone was moving around the building after hours, we could pinpoint exactly where they were before passing the information on to the police. But not once in my time there did anything ever trigger the motion sensors. And 99% of the time, the call was nothing but a false alarm in the form of an overactive door sensor. So, when the security guy on the other end of the phone told me the motion sensors were picking up movement in one of the exhibits, it really woke me up. The news generated mixed emotions in me. I was honestly surprised that we'd finally had our first break in, as despite the value of some of the equipment, a family-oriented science museum isn't exactly going to be at the top of any hardened criminal's hit list. A museum with ancient, valuable jewelry? Sure, but not a science museum. Anyway, it was obvious with a degree of surprise that I brought up the security camera program from my laptop, but as I was doing so, 
I asked the security guard where the motion sensors were being triggered. That's when he tells me they were being triggered in the human cadaver exhibit. Just what anyone would want with a preserved human corpse, I had no idea. But when I asked him how many people were walking around the exhibit after having presumably broken into the museum, he says to me in this slightly shaky and even fearful tone, see for yourself. I brought up the security camera feed, and that's when I started to seriously get the creeps. There wasn't a soul to be seen, not anywhere around the exhibit. There were only the preserved bodies, standing, sitting, or sometimes kneeling in their display cases, and as you can imagine, they were all perfectly still. I asked the security guy if he was 100% certain that the motion sensors had gone off, if it couldn't have been some kind of malfunction or error. He told me now that if there was any kind of breakdown with them, they'd simply cease to function entirely and that giving false readings was essentially impossible. He did so with that same shaky tone of terror and before long, I was starting to get pretty freaking scared myself. We watched those camera feeds for a good 10 to 15 minutes and the whole time, the exhibit was quiet as the grave. Then at one point he says, the sensors just went off again. I asked him which ones, if he could pinpoint where exactly in the exhibit the movement was coming from. He just replied, all of them. I had to drive all the way down to the museum in the middle of the night to walk around a human cadaver exhibit to make sure that there were no actual intruders. I can assure you, in no uncertain terms, that it was one of the most unnerving and terrifying experiences in my life. The place was empty all right, and no. Of course the bodies weren't moving around, but as I said, it was, without a doubt, the single creepiest moment in my entire career so far, and I sincerely hope I never have to experience anything like it ever again. A few years back, I was working overnight security in a 25-story high-rise apartment building here in Chicago. One of the things we had to do every night as part of our duties was switch over the security camera computer tape so all the footage could be backed up onto the building's main server. If there's any tech nerds reading that, and I got it wrong, please don't crucify me. I'm just a lowly security guard. Anyways, I had the tapes in hand. I'm walking down the corridor towards the elevator and it had been a particularly tiring shift. Or rather, the shift wasn't so bad. It was more I had stuff to do in the daytime, and so I couldn't get all the sleep that I normally would have been able to. Obviously, I'm totally exhausted, I'm barely awake, hardly even able to keep my freaking eyes open. So when I got towards the elevator and saw that the doors were open, I thought to myself, like, well, that's lucky. It saves me from having to wait for the thing to come up like ten darn floors. But as I got closer, I realized that there was no elevator waiting for me. It was just an open, empty elevator shaft. I'm not particularly scared of heights or anything. I mean, I have a cousin who used to get woozy at the top of playground slides when we were kids, and they would have straight up died if they'd saw what I saw. But Jesus Christ on a stolen bike, man. I swear I felt my heart trying to smash its way out of my chest when I saw how far down that thing went. I swear, man, if I'd have been in a little more of a hurry, if I'd have been just a smidge more exhausted than I already was. Heck, even if I needed to use the bathroom or something, I actually might not be here riding that's. I'd have fallen like ten whole stories before turning into a human pancake on the top of the elevator. And even worse, I might not have been discovered until people started to smell something gross or blood seep through the cracks in the ceiling hatch or whatever. I know this kind of sounds like the scariest thing that ever happened on the job was something that didn't actually happen, but I suppose that just makes me lucky as all. And I know plenty of guys that definitely haven't been as lucky when it comes to life-threatening hazards. Born on September 30th of 1969, Efren Saldivar was raised in Brownsville, Texas. But shortly after he was born, his father relocated the young family to Los Angeles, California in order to find work as a handyman. His mother found work as a tailor and as a staunch Jehovah's Witness, 
She raised her children to be both pious and proselytizing. A huge aspect of her child-rearing method was placed on them earning a place in paradise, do good works in life, and spend eternity in peace. But if if friends' worldly actions are anything to go by, he's a man who spends his afterlife in hell. During his time in junior high, a friend proved to be a subpar student. Despite being popular with the teaching staff, a friend failed to fit in with any particular social group. He was an awkward kid, and his large stature made him even more self-conscious and anxious. He lacked the confidence to approach the girls he found attractive, yet his inability to do so didn't prevent him from developing deep and longing obsessions with them. He sent them secretive, intimate, handwritten notes, seemingly unaware of how creepy and unsettling they found them. Towards the end of high school, a friend found that he had no long-term goals to speak of. He toyed with ideas of going to college or enlisting in the military, but acted on neither. When he told his father that he believed himself unable to work with others, Alfredo suggested he start his own business. A friend found the prospect quite appealing, but his deep-seated fear of rejection held him back from it. His first real job was working for a supermarket, then it's here that his sociopathy bloomed in earnest. He'd regularly steal things from both the store and his co-workers, believing himself to be more worthy of possessing them, since his poor social skills left him at a distinct disadvantage. After failing his senior year of high school, a friend found himself even more directionless, and this seems to have fostered a dark and brooding anger in him. Yet it's around that same time that the friend bumped into an old acquaintance who was wearing a nursing uniform. This friend was enrolled at the College of Medical and Dental Careers in North Hollywood and spoke fondly of their studies as both financially and spiritually rewarding. The friend was jealous, but soon discovered he had the opportunity to follow suit. He easily passed a high school equivalency test before enrolling in the technical school in 1988, and in less than a year, he not only had a certification, he had a job waiting for him close to home. Suddenly he went from being rudderless and broken to being uniformed, qualified, and upwardly mobile. The job was at the Glendale Adventist Medical Center in Southern California, and to his employer's surprise, a friend volunteered himself for duty during the medical center's night shifts. Due to the antisocial hours involved, and these shifts were extremely unpopular with the bulk of the nursing staff. Nurses would often beg for a reprieve or depart entirely rather than condemn themselves to a nocturnal lifestyle. The medical center considered themselves lucky to have a friend in their employment, but the reality was more likely they'd been cursed. A large part of a friend's job was to determine if patients were having difficulty breathing and if there was enough oxygen in their blood. His job also included respiratory rehabilitation, which involved putting tubes down patients' throats when they couldn't breathe well on their own. He was also in charge of placing people on ventilators that had to be monitored and adjusted, which was obviously a huge responsibility. The friend relished this responsibility, though, and poured himself into his work as a result. He researched extensively outside of professional hours and gained a vast amount of knowledge pertaining to the drugs and equipment used in his work. He was so well versed that even some of the center's doctors became impressed with his level of expertise. They liked him, they trusted him, but they couldn't have been more wrong to do so. Working night shifts allowed a friend to work without supervision or accountability. During that time, there was only one other technician like him in the hospital, making him an extremely valuable and lauded asset. Due to his skills, he found the work easy and emergencies rare, but he still dealt with the same psychological problems that had been festering since high school. As a result, he took Zoloft to ease a long-standing depression, yet at some point, a friend stopped taking the medication altogether. In anyone else, the changes in his personality might have been easier to observe, but due to his isolated nocturnal lifestyle, it was difficult for many to see how his perspective was becoming warped. During the twilight hours, night shift staff were unable to enter and exit the rooms of patients without anyone seeing them. On top of that, staff performing medical routines hardly draw a vast amount of attention, 
It's taken for granted that everyone is simply getting on with his or her job, allowing a friend to essentially hide his misdeeds in plain sight. Some patients were more demanding than others, and one of these was a woman by the name of Jean Coyle. On February 26th of 1997, she pressed her call button only for a friend to respond. Yet instead of remembering him dealing with her issue, all she remembered the next morning was blacking out. Jean had no idea how she'd fallen into unconsciousness, but considering her location and condition, barely gave it a second thought. In actual fact, Jean had been lucky to ever have woken up at all, as she would turn out to be a precursor victim of a man who described himself as the angel of death. A few months later, the center's only respiratory therapist observed some extremely disturbing behavior from Efren. As such, he suggested to his employers that Efren may have been doing unsavory things to patients during his night shifts. A more pointed accusation was that Efren was injecting them with something before these exact same patients were suffering unexplainable deaths. Yet despite the urgency of his accusations, there was absolutely zero proof of them. And without proof, a friend was unable to be fired, suspended, or even called into question without the possibility of serious litigation. During this period, the head of the respiratory department was a man named John Bechtold. Bechtold harbored an intense dislike of a friend, but was concerned that moving on him would simply look like manifest bias. He informed another senior member of staff that he was deeply concerned with the spate of recent inexplicable deaths, and without naming names, told them to heighten their vigilance. It was around this time that those who worked closely with a friend noticed that his shifts appeared to be somewhat cursed. Nurses would talk about patients who were irritating or unduly suffering, and then out of almost nowhere, that patient would inexplicably pass away. Sometimes several such patients would expire in the space of just one night, Yet the eye of suspicion didn't gaze upon Efren until his co-workers decided to play an innocent practical joke on him. One night, a pair of fellow nurses decided to put someone else's clothing in Efren's locker, so on his night off they pried it open. It was then that they made a very chilling discovery indeed, one in the form of a bag containing some extremely powerful narcotics, including morphine, and a drug known as Pavilon which is used to stop the breathing rhythms of patients who are going on to a respirator. It was completely forbidden for respiratory therapists to handle these drugs, and the discovery meant the medical center now had real, tangible evidence to support their morbid suspicions. However, there was just one problem. Because the stash of drugs had been uncovered by breaking into a friend's personal locker, the practical jokers were forced to remain silent regarding their discovery due to fear of termination. Despite the compelling evidence of wrongdoing, there was a high chance that only they would get into trouble, not the Fen. But then, something rather bizarre occurred that set the wheels of justice into motion, albeit in a very unconventional way. A nurse by the name of Ursula Anderson happened to mention Saldivar's after-dark activities to a man named Grant Brassus. Brassus believed he could earn a reward for the information and basically planned to extort the medical center to the tune of $50,000. And so, in February of 1998, he made a call to the Glendale Adventist Medical Center. Brassus didn't have the exact name of the so-called Angel of Death. But when a receptionist listed over 40 staff names, a friend's name jumped out at him as all too familiar. Obviously, the hospital's administration was extremely disturbed by yet another outright allegation of murder. But instead of paying Brassus for the information, they fed it straight to the Glendale Police Department. The investigator who took the case was Sergeant John McKillop in Robbery Homicide who was horrified to discover that in the time it took him to compile a case file, two more patients had died on the hospital's respiratory unit. If he was dealing with a serial killer, it was an extremely bold and prolific one. Sergeant McKillop quickly organized a sit down with three of Glendale Adventist administrators who didn't hesitate to inform him of the previous year's accusations. They also gave him the pager number of Grant Brassus, who funnily enough, 
suddenly decided that without a financial reward, he wasn't sure of anything and knew very little. However, he did pass them the name of the nurse who'd given him the tip, but she too suddenly pretended to have no knowledge of what was going on. Yet given the serious nature of the accusations, as well as the circumstantial evidence in deaths, investigators weren't nearly ready to give up the hunt for the angel of death. It wasn't long before Detective McKillop learned of the vials of drugs Efren had kept in his locker, but given the illegal nature of their discovery, he decided on another, more forward approach. He decided on questioning Efren directly. On McKillop's orders, the hospital rearranged their shift patterns to keep Efren away for several days, not only to prove that far fewer deaths occurred when he was away, but to ensure his availability for McKillop's interview. When the days finally arrived, Efren was invited to take a polygraph test and was asked if he understood why he was being subjected to one. He replied that he simply wanted to clear his name and how he'd heard that some anonymous caller had accused him of being a murderer. It seemed he proved his innocence and at first denied all wrongdoing. But in the shocking twist, he suddenly made a frank and chilling admission. During the first months of employment at the Glendale Medical Center, a friend had been assigned an elderly female patient who was on a life support system. She had a terminal case of cancer, and there was no hope for her, and according to a friend, doctors would soon turn off her machines once her family had given permission to do so. Yet instead of waiting for the permission, the friend admitted to effectively suffocating her, an act of mercy, as he called it. He then admitted that years later, after finding a half-empty discarded bottle of the stuff, he'd injected Pavilon into one patient by pumping it through their IV tube. This had stopped their breathing, effectively killing them by suffocation. Detective McKillop immediately read a friend his Miranda rights, informing him that he no longer had to incriminate himself. But a friend carried on talking for two whole hours, pouring his soul out regarding his murderous nightly activities. He would sometimes go from room to room, injecting multiple people at night, people who shouldn't have to live any longer, claiming he did so because he felt sorry for them. When asked how many patients Efren murdered, he replied, less than 50, meaning the number was easily in the mid to high 40s. When asked how he could justify such evil, Efren replied, they were ready to die. It was later established that the friend tended to stick to a very specific modus operandi. He would only ever target patients who had been given a do not resuscitate order or would have been unconscious for a prolonged period, with Detective McKillop later stating that a friend prided himself on having a very ethical criteria as to how he picked his victims. The friend also used drugs that were very hard to detect in human body tissue during autopsies it would not show up unless very specific tests were performed. This meant that getting a criminal conviction based on evidence alone be extremely difficult and would depend on actually finding the drugs in his possession and possibly even exhuming the bodies of the people he'd murdered. A friend was arrested that same day and the following morning, police officers performed a thorough search of his home. They found tons of highly disturbing explicit material, but nothing in the way of incriminating evidence. This was very, very bad news for the police, as in the United States, a person cannot be held on verbal confession alone, no matter how much they confess or how brutal the crime. As a result, a friend was released after just 48 hours, as the police were forced to conduct a more thorough investigation. Despite the lack of any formal charges being brought against him, a friend was fired from his job on March 13th of 1998 and 37 of his colleagues were suspended while the hospital conducted their own investigation. In the meantime, a friend contacted a defense attorney and on their advice, did something despicable. He completely recanted his confession, claiming he hadn't actually killed anyone and only gave a false confession because he had a depression-induced mental disorder. He cited a huge amount of police pressure to give a confession claiming he was so terrified that he'd be beaten by unhinged officers that he simply fabricated the entire story. The entire case now hinged on obtaining physical evidence, with Detective McKillop swiftly forming a task force consisting of six experienced investigators. They rented a house near the hospital, 
using it as a temporary headquarters to consult with numerous experts on medical malpractice. According to them, the angel of death phenomenon was not entirely uncommon. Some do it out of mercy, some for profit, some to look like heroes while they revive the patient, and some from a pure sadistic delight in playing God. Despite a friend claiming that he was motivated by mercy, pharmaceutical experts told detectives that shutting down someone's respiratory system using Pavilon was anything but merciful. Pavilon is derived from a highly toxic South American plant known as Kirari, one used by certain indigenous Colombian tribes to poison their hunting arrows. Those stricken by the toxin D. tubo and fall into a conscious paralysis and feel every minute of the death by suffocation process. They're fully aware of what's happening and are unable to scream or motion for help as their throats close over, and they're forced to lie there, completely helpless, as they slowly expire. It soon became apparent that investigators had a Herculean task ahead of them. During the eight years that Efron had been employed by the hospital, over a thousand patients had expired during his shifts. Since police couldn't exactly exhume more than a thousand corpses, they began to narrow down the list until it included only more recent, more mysterious cases. It took an entire year, but eventually the task force narrowed it down to just 20 individual cases, and out of these 20, they only needed a handful of convictions to put Ifren away for life. And so, in the summer of 1999, the grisly process of exhumations began in earnest. One by one, police and cemetery workers tore the bodies of the dead from their final resting places before sending them to the pathologists who took tissue samples from the livers, bladders, and muscles. After that, the toxology labs went to work. Scientists at the Forensic Science Center in Oakland, California, concentrated on searching for Pavilon. This is because the other drugs Ifren used break down into elements natural to the human body and are therefore basically undetectable. Pavilon, on the other hand, could remain detectable in the body for years. All the scientists had to do was find dosage levels out of the normal range and bingo, they'd have found one of Ifren's victims. Initially, investigators were dismayed when the science team sent back a dozen negative results, and for a while, it seemed as if all their efforts had been in vain. Then, almost out of nowhere, tissue samples began to test positive for massive amounts of pavilion. At first, three positive results came back, then four, then five, and six. In the end, it seemed as if detectives would be able to charge a friend with a grand total of six murders, enough to put him away for literally hundreds of years if they could land concurrent sentences. January of 2001 saw the first criminal charges leveled against Efren, who was arrested on his way to his new construction job one morning. This time, he gave a fresh but equally sociopathic version of events that the hospital had been so understaffed that he decided to ease the workload by murdering patients. As he himself phrased it, when he was at his wit's end, he would look at the list of patients and think to himself, who do we have to get rid of? By the time he'd admitted to killing at least 60 different people, he claimed that he'd lost count, but figured he wouldn't be surprised if the number was higher than 100. He said that after a while, he'd grown so used to killing that he just let it all slip from his mind. You don't plan it, he told Detective McKillop, so after you do it, you tend not to think about it for the rest of the day or ever. At a friend's trial, the prosecution's star witness was none other than Jean Coyle, the first woman he had chemically experimented on. Ursula Anderson, the female respiratory therapist, who not only knew what a friend was doing, but had supplied him with Pavilon at one point, received legal immunity in exchange for her testimony. Finally, in March 2002, the friend Saldivar pled guilty to six counts of murder in exchange for life imprisonment rather than the death penalty. Efren contested nothing regarding the investigation and accepted his sentence. Judge Lance Ito, the same man who had presided over the O.J. Simpson trial, gave Detective McKillop his wish, handing Efren six consecutive life sentences and 15 more years for attempted murder. During the aftermath of his trial, Efren offered an apology to the families. I know there is nothing I can say that can soothe their anger or bring relief to their anxiety, he said, 
adding, I want to say that I'm truly sorry, and I ask for forgiveness, although I don't expect any. It should come as no surprise that not a single family of his victims offered any words of comfort, but there was one point of sickening irony, and that's if he'd been condemned to die for his crimes, if Fren would have been given the same drug as the one he'd used on his patients, and that the substance he'd once used to kill the innocent would have been the exact same substance used to kill him. In the early hours of December 9th, 2020, Spanish migrant worker Marta Elena Vento was manning the reception desk of the Bournemouth branch of the budget hotel chain Travel Lodge in southern England. The 27-year-old had moved to the UK in February of that year and had initially worked in a recruitment center before accepting a better paid position at the hotel. Part of the superior pay came from the fact that she would occasionally be forced to work the night shift which proved to be as tiresome as it was exhausting. Yet, Marta didn't complain. The lifestyle might have been exhausting, but there were considerably more employment opportunities in England than there were in her native Spain. Not only that, but the salaries were considerably higher, too. Yet, despite the promise of improved prosperity, it seems her decision to move to England had been a grave and terrible mistake. As that morning... A man named Stephen Richard Cole suddenly walked into the hotel's reception area and irreversibly changed her fate. Just a few days prior to walking into the hotel, Stephen had been kicked out of his temporary home at the Russell Court Hotel after getting into a violent altercation with two of his fellow guests. He was forced to check into another hotel and did so on December 7th, opting for the same branch of travel lodge that employed Marta. Staff later said he exhibited some rather strange and decidedly disturbing behavior, saying he had become agitated about the room's smoke detectors. Unconfirmed reports have stated that Stephen believed they were not smoke detectors, but were instead a means of monitoring his brain waves. Other reports state that, at one point, Stephen had begun hammering his fists against the fourth floor windows of his hotel room, calling for help from passers-by as if he was detained against his own will. However, we can most certainly confirm that on the very same day Stephen checked into the travel lodge, members of his family had contacted his doctor to request urgent antipsychotic medication. He was already being prescribed such medication, but had recently confessed to having thrown his pills away, telling his family they were turning him numb and zombie-like. They may well have been having a distressing, debilitating effect on him, but without them, his mental health was rapidly deteriorating, and by the time he checked into the travel lodge, he was suffering from a full-on mental breakdown. What happened next is completely up for speculation, as we can draw a number of conclusions as to why Stephen had hair clippers in his possession. One of the signs of a complete mental breakdown is that the sufferer suddenly feels the desire to shave all their hair off. A classic example of this would be the now-famous Britney Spears incident of February 2007, when the young singer drove to a Los Angeles hair salon one night before shaving all of her hair off. Some psychologists describe it as a desire for purity, the desire to start again anew, manifesting in a mildly self-destructive behavior. But in Stephen's case, it could have been pure paranoia. If he believed that the fire alarms were brainwave monitors, if he believed someone was after him to the extent of screaming for help from his hotel window, then he might have believed that changing his appearance could aid in him evading danger. But the fact is, we'll never truly know. All we know for certain is that Stephen had these hair clippers in his hand when he took the elevator down to the hotel lobby and began walking past the reception desk. When Marta heard the elevator's door opening, there's little doubt that she looked up to see who it was. Not many people roamed the hotel's hallways in the small hours of the morning, but those who did were always greeted by the same warm smile she had been trained to display upon the appearance of a guest. Martha was a beautiful young woman, with deep brown eyes, brunette hair, with dip-dyed blonde tips and a wide ivory smile. It was a common occurrence that guests would react positively even with glee, whenever she flashed that smile at them. It meant they were welcome, 
that she was ready to help, that she'd do anything within her power to ensure they had a wonderful and comfortable stay. But to Stephen Cole, it meant the polar opposite. When Stephen looked over to the reception counter and saw the warm, inviting look on Marta's face, he didn't see a smile. He saw laughter. He saw mockery. He saw provocation. As he later phrased it, she was looking down on him. There's no way of us knowing how the actual exchange went down, but it's safe to say that there were at least a few words exchanged before what happened next. Stephen might have asked what she was smiling about, and in all likelihood his confrontational erratic demeanor would have caught Marta off guard. She may have attempted to defend the smile, perhaps reassuring him she meant nothing but positivity, but in Stephen's mind, he knew better. Marta was smiling, laughing at him even, because she was part of the ongoing conspiracy that plagued his every waking moment. Her smile was one of satisfaction, knowing that they, whoever they were, were entirely successful in making his life torture. He couldn't sleep, he could barely eat, and we know full well that he could barely keep a linear thought in his head. In an instant, she became the living embodiment of all his torturous woe. In a flash of reckless abandon, Stephen charged. Martyr had been alone in the lobby that night with no one to save her from the brutal, prolonged assault that followed. CCTV footage showed Stephen hurtling behind the counter, bringing the full force of the clippers in his hands down on the side of her head. Marta was in the middle of finding her feet when the blow knocked her to the ground, but instead of leaving his victim to languish on the floor in stunned agony, Stephen began stomping on her head and chest with full force over and over again. Marta then tried to crawl away from her attacker, but only made it as far as an alcove set into the rear wall of the staff area. Essentially, she trapped herself in a kind of bottleneck allowing Stephen to continue the senseless and hideous assault. The footage showed that Stephen had already started shaving his head by the time the attack commenced, and the images of his half-bald skull made it obvious that he was a dangerously unhinged individual. He once again brought the clippers down onto her head with all the violence he could muster, and he continued to beat, kick, and stomp on her for 42 minutes. Only when his victim was a ghastly mess of blood and gore did Stephen even think to cease his assault. By then, there was blood on the floor, on the walls, on the desk where the staff computer sat. The hotel guests who later discovered Marta's lifeless body would describe the scene as looking like an abattoir or a slaughterhouse, and that Marta's face, head, and chest were so badly bloodied and broken that the sight made him violently ill. CCTV footage showed Stephen pacing back and forth as the reality of the situation kicked in. Some of his movements and body language could be described as remorseful, as he seemed to be barely able to bring himself to look at the damage he'd wrought. We know that he returned to his hotel room for a brief period, or he cleaned the blood off of his face and hands before returning to the hotel lobby. Only that time, he couldn't bring himself to look over at the vacant reception area. Stephen went immediately to the nearest police station and, with deep black circles around his eyes, he approached the reception desk for the second time that night, before stating, I have just killed someone in the hotel. I think she worked there. I haven't been getting any sleep. I've had no sleep in six days. The attending police officers were so stunned by the shocking confession that at first, they asked him if it was some kind of sick joke. Stephen assured them that it wasn't then showed them some of the blood he'd failed to scrub from under his fingernails. Only then did the grim reality of his confession kick in, and although they maintained a calm and non-threatening manner as per their training, police officers placed Stephen under arrest at around 8.30 a.m., then took him to one of the station's holding cells. They then ordered uniformed officers to drive over to the hotel to confirm Stephen's story, but by then, the first 999 calls had already started to flood in. Investigating officers soon discovered that Stephen was already known to them prior to the attack. In fact, Stephen had only been released from prison just two months prior, 
having been convicted of three separate incidents of indecent exposure during the summer of 2020. A psychiatrist later said that Stephen had struggled to function following his release from prison and that the experience had prompted nothing short of a psychological nosedive. Stephen also had a previous offense of battery on his own mother stemming from 2018, showing that he was indeed an extremely dangerous and hideously violent offender. At his initial criminal hearing, the defending attorney stated that Stephen was suffering with schizophrenia which led to abnormal functioning. He was suffering from persecutory delusions, auditory hallucinations and disorganized thinking, abnormalities which impaired his judgment and self-control. The doctor who assessed Mr. Cole implied it was a sudden and impulsive decision and caused by the way she smiled and looked at him. There's no doubt that he suffers from a very serious illness. After hearing that Stephen had been unable to obtain the necessary prescription medication, Judge Angela Morris said that there were irreversible failures in the lead-up to Cole's brutal, sustained, and horrific attack on Marta, and that questions had to be asked of local mental health authorities. Judge Morris added that Marta was relentlessly beaten and violently attacked in such a manner that she was not able to breathe while unconscious. She died alone and with no one able to help or save her. She subsequently advised that Stephen be detained under the UK's Mental Health Act and would be interred at a violent offender's mental unit near Farham in the county of Hampshire. This kind of senseless murder proves just how devastating it can be when there are failures in a country's mental health system. And although Stephen was undoubtedly a disturbed and predatory individual, we're left to wonder if Marta's death could have been avoided if he'd only been able to obtain such vital medication. If his troubled mental state had been identified earlier, if his perversions had been isolated and treated instead of locking him away with other hardened criminals, then maybe, just maybe, Marta Vento would still be alive today.